Hi everyone, this is the OU Post Game Show. I've been watching sports now for about 30 years, baseball, basketball, as well as some hockey, and of course football, high school, college, and pro. And the one common denominator that you notice when it comes to team sports is that you win with terrific defense. That was evident in Oklahoma's 35-13 win over the Kansas Jayhawks. For the Sooners, back on the winning track, record of 4-3 and three overall, and in the Big 12, a record of 2-1. and one. And for Kansas, in which the road's only going to get rougher for the Jayhawks, they dropped to 1-2 and two in Big 12 play. The Oklahoma offense, for the first half, I thought they looked lethargic. I didn't think that they looked that good. But that's where a terrific defense like Oklahoma really comes into play. I thought the Sooner defense, from the first play from scrimmage, set the tempo. Quentin Carter picks off a pass on the first play from scrimmage as um, Reesing was trying to hit Briscoe. They were trying to surprise the Sooners on a long pass play, but Carter stepped in front of it and made a diving interception. That was important for Oklahoma because they would eventually score on their first drive. But I thought the biggest play in the game, speaking of interceptions, happened early in the second quarter. OU up 7-0, but Kansas, early in the second quarter, was knocking on the door. They had second and goal inside the 15-yard line. Kansas lined up with four wide receivers, three on the right side. It was a trips formation. Two of the receivers sprinted toward the end zone. The other receiver ran a short route toward the sideline, right in the direction of Dominic Franks. What an intelligent play Franks made because Reesing had his eye strictly on the receiver he was going to throw to. Didn't look anywhere else, but was aimed at that receiver. Franks knew that, and once Reesing released the ball, then Franks jumped right in front of it. 85 yards later, touchdown for Oklahoma. An intelligent play by Dominic Franks and for uh, Todd Reesing. Um, a lesson that sometimes if you're going to throw the ball to a particular receiver, you know, don't just be glued in on him from the progression of the play to its finish because a terrific corner like Dominic Franks is going to be able to read that like the cover of a book and make you pay for it. And for Reesing, a good quarterback for Kansas, a three-year starter, but he will never forget this game for the rest of his life. It was his worst, a career-high three interceptions, all three interceptions in the first half. Dominic Franks with an intelligent play, and it took what could have been a 7-3 Oklahoma lead or perhaps a tie if Kansas had been able to punch it in inside the red zone. It took it to a 14 to nothing lead, and I think it reaffirmed Oklahoma that they were going to be the team to win this game. 14 to nothing at that point, and it seemed like Kansas, from an emotional standpoint, had a difficult time recovering after that. And also the Jayhawks, I thought, had a couple of other opportunities in the game. They had that opportunity, plus when the game was at 14 to uh, three Oklahoma, Kansas had an opportunity to cut into that lead after they picked off the Landry Jones pass. The interception was not his fault, by the way. It wasn't Jones' fault. We'll talk more about that in a second. But on the first play for Kansas, with the score at 14 to three Oklahoma late in the first half, and the ball in Oklahoma territory, Todd Reesing had a wide open Des Briscoe, and Oklahoma had a coverage meltdown. Something happened because Briscoe was wide open over the middle. Briscoe juggled the ball and could not hang on to it. If he holds on to the ball, it's a touchdown, and the Jayhawks go into the locker room down by only four points at 14 to 10. Instead, it was a 14 to 6 halftime lead as the Jayhawks did manage a long field goal but missed out on the touchdown. When the offense spitter sputtered for Oklahoma, which they did in the first half, the defense for Oklahoma was fantastic from quarter one to quarter four. I thought they controlled this ball game for the most part, and we learned that the defense actually became like an offense for Oklahoma because of that long interception return for a touchdown by Franks. Give props again to the coaching staff, to Bob Stoops, to Brent Benables as well, the defensive coordinator. I thought Oklahoma did a really good job preparing for this game, um, X's and O's wise, and also mentally, because after that Texas loss, you lose your third game of the year, it would have been easy to just go into this game going through the motions and not really caring. But Oklahoma is proving that they do still have a lot to play for, even though the national championship is out of the picture, and even though a Big 12 championship is going to be pretty tough for the um, Sooners to get. And the Sooners, give them credit, they prove that they still have a lot to play for because you can still have a 9-3 and three season, possibly 10-3 and three if you win your bowl game, 9-4 and four at worst-case scenario. Oklahoma is proving that they are still 
a pretty darn good football team and that those three losses that they had were games that they could have or should have won earlier this year. So good job to Oklahoma for bouncing back and for beating Kansas. And the Oklahoma offense, even though the first half they didn't look very good, the second half they played much better. They had back-to-back -back drives to start the third quarter, both resulting in touchdowns, and both TDs they earned by driving the ball the length of the field. Now let's go ahead and review the four keys to the game that I highlighted on the matchup show. We already talked about this a little bit. Don't give Todd the nod. Huge thumbs up. Maybe the biggest thumbs up of the year. I thought this was Oklahoma's shining hour as their defense made life rough for number five for Kansas. Three interceptions, as I mentioned, including an interception on the very first play of the game. And not only the secondary play, well, but what about the defensive line and the job Adrian Taylor as well as Jerry McCoy did in pressuring Reesing all day long. And don't forget about the defensive ends, Jeremy Beal, who I think right now is the most valuable player on the Sooner defensive team, and Austin English with his three quarterback sacks. Kudos to the uh, Sooner D in this one. Number two, Landry Jones, this is your team. Thumbs up as well. Um, Jones completed most of his passes on this day, and he had two touchdown passes. The interception, by the way, was not his fault because the ball hit Cameron Kinney on the hands and ricocheted into the air, resulting in the interception. So, again, you can't blame Jones for that one. And Cameron Kinney, you know, getting off the subject, I don't know how much more his playing time is going to be limited. Remember against Baylor, he did not play a whole heck of a lot, and that's because they were not happy with how he started that game against the Bears. And this one, Bob Stoops was all up in his grill for that um, botched catch attempt. And with the way Tunnell's playing right now, which is much better, you have Caleb coming into his own and Ryan Broyles back. And by the way, Broyles tied a school record with 11 catches in the game, tying um, Joaquin Iglesias' record from last season. It's going to be hard for Kenny to really get quality playing time, the way he's playing right now and the way the other receivers are playing. But getting back to the subject of uh, Langry Jones, thought he did a, a good job, especially in the second half when the Sooner offense was finally able to kick it into high gear. Number three, time of possession. We're going to go thumbs off. I think um, even though Kansas had a slight edge in time of possession, um, they didn't really do a whole lot with the football once they got it. Of course, the turnovers had a lot to do with it, but also Oklahoma's defense and um, not breaking when at times they bend it, but they never broke. The only touchdown Oklahoma gave up was late in the ball game, which was insignificant because it was 35-6 to at that point in the game. The game was already over. Um, Oklahoma got whipped at time of possession in the first half, but in the second half they uh, got the edge back a little bit in the T.O.P. category. So slight edge to Kansas in time of possession, but we go thumbs off because um, Kansas really didn't do a whole lot with that time of possession advantage. And then number four, remember the second, but forget the first. We're talking about remember the second half of the season, but try to put the first half behind you. Another easy thumbs up for Oklahoma. You know, the Miami, Texas, and BYU losses, we've harped on it before, games that Oklahoma could have won. You can't do anything about those games. Oklahoma, if anything, they are learning from those close losses. And also, I think the competition in the first half of the season benefited them a lot more than Kansas. Remember, the Jayhawks had not played a ranked opponent all season long. And... I think that that really had a lot to do with how Kansas played in this particular game because Colorado was the toughest team that, that Kansas had faced all season long, and they had lost to the Buffaloes the preceding week before the uh, Oklahoma game. Oklahoma was battle-tested. Kansas was not. And for Oklahoma, the second half of the season, as I mentioned earlier, they're going to have a chance to perhaps run the table. I know Texas Tech will be tough in Lubbock, and the OSU game, despite it being in Norman, won't be a picnic. But the way Oklahoma's defense is playing right now, I think that the uh, Texas, BYU, and Miami losses are further back in Oklahoma's memory than we might realize. I think the Sooners are moving forward and not backward. Great sign for the Sooners, and again, thumbs up, and remember the second. I thought that was um, important for them to win in that key, and they have so far. For the Kansas Jayhawks, it's only going to get tougher. They still have road games with Texas Tech and Texas. I think they lose both of those. And suddenly that game at Kansas State, maybe the game at the beginning of the year, you might pencil in a win for Kansas. Well, don't do that now. In fact, I think K-State is going to beat Kansas. So those going to be three losses right there for the Jayhawks. The game against Nebraska, that's another good defense that the Jayhawks will face. That could be a loss. And then you have the game against Missouri to close out the year in Kansas City. That's a rivalry game. So all five of Kansas' remaining games could be losses. If they were to lose all five of those, then they would finish the year at 5-7 and seven and take an enormous step back. 
We'll see if the Jayhawks can pull it together. And for Oklahoma, as we mentioned, the road looks pretty good for them. They're going to have a not-so-easy game, though, on Halloween night against Kansas State. Remember, it is a 6 o'clock um, October 31st kickoff between the Wildcats and the Sooners. Right now, Kansas State, they're leading the Big 12 North, if you can believe that, and they're leading it by a game and a half. Bill Snyder's team is playing better ball now than they did in September. So Oklahoma will be at home, but that's not a game where they can just think that they're going to win just because they show up. They'll have to play well against Kansas State to keep the momentum going. Again, the final score... 35-13, Oklahoma with another victory over Kansas. They still have not lost to the Jayhawks since 1997. Good news, though, for Kansas. Basketball season is coming soon. Take it easy.